Um, so like within 30 minutes, there's a lot of, I don't want to call them tangents because I think they're actually fairly rich and relevant that we could go down. We can't go down all of them, but if there's points of things that you're interested in that I'm saying, you know, this is a sufficient level to understand for this. And you're like, wait, wait, I actually want to understand it better than just sufficient for your research. I'm completely happy to go off on these things. Um, but I tried to explain everything good enough for you to be able to understand the work Jonathan Ray and I did. Um, but feel free, like we can spend more time talking about different things. So the, this is based on a paper that we recently submitted to PRA uh, called Detecting Violations of Macrorealism when the original like Gettgard inequalities are satisfied. I'll explain what this is. And just because I like this painting, uh, this is a painting I'm using as my cover page. So I'm gonna just sort of jump right into the background here. I wanna do a bit of a bridge in. Let's say I hand you a black box and I swear to you, it behaves non-classically. I swear to you. How would you go about proving it? And feel free to jump in with ideas. Like if you have some, like what first comes to mind? So this is an active uh, teaching presentation, <laughs> right? I mean, yeah, I, cool. I would try to extract entanglement from. That's what I would do. The extract entanglement, you said? Yes, I would try to couple two quantum systems to this black box, try to get them entangled out of that. That's that wouldn't work, Rick, that, Dallas, that wouldn't work. A classical field can entangle two things. If I interact two detectors through a classical field, I can get them entangled too. Yeah, but for, uh, first, for first try, you basically will try entanglement witness experiment and then you see if this thing doesn't work, then you try something else. I, I, I guess that I would understand what the black box is. It's got an input and an output, that's it. Is that what you mean by that? Or what do you mean by black box? Um, so I guess, yeah, black box usually just means input output. So you can think of it like that. You can think of it as a system in which you can take some measurement on. So you can try to measure different properties of the system. Um, so so uh, what, one thing that you can do is try to characterize, I mean, you have only one copy or you have many copies? You can have many copies. <laughs> then you can try to characterize the behavior on phase space and check if you can write us a statistical distribution on phase space. If you can't, if it's negative at some point, that is quantum. Okay. okay. Yeah, see the distribution of phase space. So I mean, these are all related. These are maybe a bit more abstract, but these are good. Like it's the right train of, of thinking for these things. So I'll, I'll, I'll give some examples of how it's done, but I want to motivate this question further. So you guys are thinking about it, but also why should anyone care to answer this question? Well, detecting quantum behavior is interesting for studying the persistence of quantum coherence. Um, so that can be persistence to higher level systems, to greater times, whatever it may be. And also for identifying quantum effects or developing new technologies. So people are putting quantum in front of, of anything uh, and writing papers about it. But how do we actually know it's quantum or not? I mean, a good example from maybe 10 years ago was NMR quantum computing. Uh, it was met with a lot of resistance and you know, there's nothing quantum about this. What's your, what's your argument for this being quantum? And so arguing that things actually have quantum behavior um, is an important discussion. And maybe it's just a comment. I think this is really where people confuse the purpose of Leggett Garg inequalities. When I went to go do my master's thesis on it, one of the, um, I asked somebody to be on my committee and they said they didn't want to be because they, they don't like Leggett Garg inequalities. And I asked them why. And they said, well, everyone believes quantum mechanics is real. And I'm like, that's not the point. Like, I'm not arguing whether it exists. I'm trying to figure out does it exist here in this spot? Um, in this system. So that's, that's. I think most skeptics of Leggett garg tests are gonna argue, well, we all know quantum mechanics is true, but not everything behaves quantum mechanically. Anyways, so the first test that um, sort of came yes, from- I may make a quick comment. That's something yeah. that I actually faced by people that know very well quantum mechanics, but telling them this is a classical, when I tell them this is classical, there's nothing quantum in it. And people have told me, oh, but you're communicating through a quantum field. And I said, well, still it's classical. Right. There's nothing quantum about this way. And people do object saying, but it's quantum anyways, even, you know, that's, so this is a really, very relevant question. Yeah. Well, one thing I've seen a lot, like when I was learning about quantum heat engines, it seemed like everyone just thought any nanoscale heat engine is a quantum heat engine. But just because it's small, doesn't make it quantum. And that was so frustrating that these papers, I felt didn't give enough time really arguing that their system behaved quantum mechanically. Um, so, anyway, so as a, as a first test, um, and similar to like the first thoughts you guys had, which is natural is entanglement. And so I, I'm, I'm not gonna assume you know the Bell tests, but I'm gonna tell you everything about the Bell tests you need to know to understand how Leggett garg is derived from it. So you have uh, a bipartite quantum system, so a quantum system in two parts. 
and it comes into existence. I won't, different ways that can happen, let's say, at some point in the origin, and it moves towards two detectors, and detectors measure them. And the idea, and I'm speaking, now I'm going to speak a bit abstractly, and I'll explain it, is you're going to measure different marginal probabilities. And what you're gonna find is that there's no underlying joint probability that matches it. So let, let, me, sh let me show what that looks like. So yeah, by the way, that thing that you said, how is that different from what I said? <laughs> yeah, the not. difference is that you assume locality in the end. You see, the, the thing is that uh, classical fields can entangle things, but you have to, to, to like use one of the particles as a source and I'm then get to the about, other one. I was talking about my proposal, the one where I just uh, measure the phase space of the box and I find that there's no joint probability distribution. Yeah. That oh, no, that, that, that's fair enough. But that's the same thing as, as the thing that I said of harvesting entanglement. That, uh, that's what I'm arguing. No, because no, the no, thing no. is that if you harvest entanglement uh, under the assumptions of the, the down inequalities, what? No, no, it doesn't matter if it's harvesting or not, but extract entanglement out of the, the system under the, the assumption that uh, you have these two, uh, these two states that are measured which do not communicate classically, essentially, right? You, you will have to prevent no, no, no. LOCC in the what they do. You don't know what they do inside the box. You have an input, and if the, if the input is separable and the output is entangled, I don't know what happened. It, it could be my system or quantum, and they can get entangled through something classical. That could happen. I don't know what happens inside the box. There's not enough to tell that the box is quantum by that. Again, a classical field can entangle two systems that are quantum. A potential, a V of X, a potential V of X, even a delta potential can entangle. So you're way. saying that the box itself can can can, can be classical and entangled okay. to quantum systems that are separable. Yes, but that is because okay, that that depends on the the, the how big the box is. In the end. <laughs> I don't care. I don't know what the box is. So uh, it's not enough that they entangle. I would argue that two inputs that are separable getting entangled through the box is not enough to prove to me that it's quantum. I can give you a counter example. That's what I mean. So. Here, just to explain what these probability tables are for those who aren't familiar with it, and they don't see the connection right away between Eduardo's answer and this. It's that, so I take this system, and let's say I do four measurements on it. And these measurements are, are I'm calling them S1, S2, S3, S4. They're each dichotomic. It gives me back a plus or a minus. So here, it's the probability that all four measurements are plus goes here. The probability it's minus, minus, plus, plus goes there. These can be, these aren't necessarily in order. They can be separated in space, time, whatever. It's just four measurements on the system. I don't measure this. What I measure are marginal probabilities. So a, an example of a marginal probability is say these two, I'm measuring that the first state is plus, second is plus, third is plus, but I don't measure S4. So I get this whole probability. I don't know how much of that probability is here, how much of it's there. I just know the probability of this rectangle. So I can do this for different combinations of rectangles, and I can get numbers that all make sense. They're all above zero and they all add to one. But when I use these to reconstruct the underlying table, I'll find that some of them are negative. And that's when I know I have a violation of classicality. So I can do that in different ways. I can measure it at two times instead, whatever. So I presented things in terms of marginal probabilities and probability tables, because I think that's a better intuition for them. You can convert those probability tables into inequalities. I'm gonna give an example of what that looks like, um, but the converting from probability tables to inequalities can be done in many, many different ways. And there isn't, type, there isn't a proof that there exists a set of conditions that gives you um, a tight bound in general. So I could come up with conditions based on a marginal probability table that can tell me if there's negativity sometimes, but they don't always guarantee that there's some negativity. I can't find a perfect set of conditions in general. Now, there are some cases you can. That's called Fine's theorem, um, but it's not always there. Anyways, so the probability tables can be written as inequalities, sometimes perfectly, sometimes imperfectly. So, Clearly, this is what we require is an entangled bipartite system. And it needs to be sufficiently separated to rule out communication before measurement. Because maybe they just talk really fast and I miss it. Well, can I just ask one question here? Please, please. Maybe maybe a little bit like time traveling to the future. But uh, so when you say this requires entangled bipartite system and rule out before measurement kind of communication, right? Mm. Does that mean that whatever you're going to do after this slide, for example, right, is basically under LOCC? So 
No, because I'm about to say why I don't like entangled bipartite systems. Okay. No, so, because because I was just I, I was just reminded a paper that I think I mentioned in a few group meetings before that Rob Spackens from PI actually did a analysis of Bell test, right? And show that the answer can be really perverse if you do it under LOCC kind of regime and entanglement with an LOCC regime. But if you do shared entangle uh, shared randomness, then the answer is very different. So I was just wondering whether whether the setup itself makes this obvious, I guess. Sure. So, the, so I think people have continued studying Bell tests and I think theoretically, I get why they would want to. Here's the reason I wouldn't want to. It's because of these two requirements. If I'm an experimentalist and I have some new device and I say it behaves quantum mechanically, if the only test is a Bell test, well, I need to go take this outside of the lab, separate it somehow many, many kilometers apart. I think you need at least, what is it, like 18 kilometers to rule out some local signal. Okay, roughly 18 kilometers, let's say. And I need entanglement. What if my system doesn't have entanglement, but it has quantum superposition? So it has two clear limitations, a practical one in that you need distance and a theoretical limitation in that not all quantum systems are entangled. Um, so that's my issue with Bell test and why I think they're limiting in tests of quantum behavior. Uh, can, can I ask something regarding yeah, Eduardo's uh, thing? Uh, Edu, how, how does your, your proposal uh, rule out the, the communication before measurement and stuff? Uh, because you see that that is the that is the only problem that you no, have no, there no. to be honest everything, right? happens the only... in time. everything that i say happens inside the black box i have two separable states you don't communicate before anything i put them as an input of the black box i say the black box make them interact classically they just make them interact through some potential x1 times x2 for example that's enough and then the output is the same two particles then the other two particles are entangled and it's right, but but, uh, but you ha have to make sure that there's no other external potential that will be able to to provide a, a... no I'm sorry a, 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 why does any any potential uh, work I'm sorry not I don't, any don't any potential that, that uh, there's an infinite amount of pot classical potentials that get two particles entangled yeah if I have imagine two spins that come in and I make them interact inside the box through a classical potential or imagine two two free particles x. And, and, and in, in, their, in their potential, I establish a classical inside the box. I have a classical potential x1 times x2. That is enough to get them entangled. Just put them in something that are not eigenstates of x when they enter a wave packet. They will get entangled. And it's just a classical potential. It could be the Coulomb potential. That does it too. <laughs> the classical Coulomb potential. That does it. I just wrote something really simple, but the classical Coulomb potential will do it too. I think I see it. It's just that it's just I think the dictionary, the setup is just it's like very, very simple. I think that that's what's what's uh, messing with me. Sorry for that. Yeah, sorry. No, okay. Um, okay, so pretty much that's what I get as far as I go with Bell tests is that yes, they can detect quantum behavior, but the distance and the entanglement are, are limitations. Anthony Leckett and Anupam Garg, I think it was 1985. Yeah, it was 1985. They proposed a test that address these limitations. And essentially it's, in the last example, we measured a correlation that was spatially separated. Uh, so we took the point, we measured it at, at two points in space. Here the detector takes a picture at time one and then another picture at time two, for instance. And now we measure uh, correlations through time instead of space. In doing, coming up with this new test, they defined a notion called macro realism. And it's a combination of three postulates postulates together say is that a time evolving system possesses definite properties irrespective of measurements. So if I measure it in the past or in the future, the act of my measurement isn't going to um, alter the system's time, its properties as it evolves through time. Is that okay? Or so, so I don't know. I'm not sorry if I understand completely. So it's, uh, uh, it's the time evolution from here to here would not notice if I measure here, right? It's, an, it's not that you don't update after measurement, no? It's more that the fact that you're gonna measure it doesn't change that there are properties in it, is that it? Yeah, before or after. So like you're, you like have time one, it evolves, time two, you measure it. If I measure it again here, actually, no, it is saying both. It's saying that, measure, that systems evolve independently of measurements. Yeah, that's what I mean. 
but, yeah. but still, of course, the, the act of measurement in quantum mechanics usually uh, uh, updates the state. There's something, the measurement does something to the state. Right, exactly. But if the system was non-quantum, uh, if it's classical, yeah. then you don't have to worry about that. So this notion of macro realism is like a fine assumption to make for classical systems, but it's not a good assumption to make for quantum systems. So you're saying that for, for classical systems, I mean, being a little bit more like conservative, for classical systems, the, the impact of a measurement of a particular observable can be arbitrarily small, whereas for quantum, no, no, kind of. Yeah, it can, it can be, or it may, with this notion of macro realism, they distinguish uh, a quantum system from a classical one as one in which measurements um, are significant enough or yeah. are, can significantly disturb the state of the system is what makes the system quantum mechanical. This right. is like- But that's, but that's not the quantum. definition of quantum mechanics, right? I mean, for example, I can think of a classical system that is, uh, uh, what if the, the universe was made out of very little very small balls, and I put a bunch of them, classical, right, classical balls, I, mean, I put a bunch of them in a box, and then, well, if I want to know where one of these small balls are, I'm going to have to hit it with another one, and that's going to really affect the, the, no, the one that I'm trying to measure, right? Value, if you get information in quantum, there's no way, so in classical, you can think to obtain the same information with a non-perturbing measurement, whereas in quantum, if you do obtain the information, there's no way, you've already acted on the system. So if I obtain a one, I really acted on the system a lot, possibly. So no? you bring up a good point, and this is like one of sort of the so there was there's three underlying sort of a, a subtleties here, things you assume. One thing you assume is the arrow of time in coming up with this. Another one you assume is that um, no, it's possible to have non-invasive measurability classically. That it's classically possible to extract information without disturbing the system is another assumption you make. And then the last assumption you make is that systems exist in definite states. So that, um, yeah. But, but okay, uh, with these things, then I understand my, the, 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 definite state, my the definite state is a bit uh, blurry as well, because by definite state, you mean that anything that characterizes the system, for example, a probability distribution is a state and is definite. Yeah, so that's a good question about probability. So the, so yeah, so the probability def, uh, distribution, probabilities, yeah, that's true, that's not a definite state. So if I give you a pure state psi, ket psi, hmm. that's a definite state. But it's, a, it's in, instead, a, there's a, with the outcome of observables, there are probability distributions associated with them. So the, I want to understand if by definite state, you mean that uh, something like local hidden variables or not? Like the, 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 the fact that we have the fact that we have uh, uncertainty about the outcome of experiments is because we're ignorant or because it's intrinsically probabilistic, no? Is that, is that? Yeah, so originally the argument was made in contradict, like as opposition to Einstein's notion of like uh, local hidden variables. So yes, that is true. But I think in the example you gave of a, of a pure state, uh, so it exists in a definite state, that part is, is true, but the postulate it wouldn't satisfy is non-invasive measurability that there's a measurement you can make um, like you to extract information from that, unless you already know what state it's in, then to extract information, you would have to change the state. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So it's the common, and people have mixed and matched these postulates in different ways to make slightly different versions of notions of realism. And for each, there's different types of experiments you can come to violate them with them. This is the one that Anthony Leggett and the Newcomb Guard came up with. But in its simplest statement, it's it's that there that I've sort of read a couple of times. Okay, good. So, so last time I said we, I wasn't going to go from the marginal probabilities to the conditions, but with Leggett and Garg, they did. So they take measurements on the system, they check whether or not it matches an underlying probability distribution, and they describe whether or not it matches using an inequality. And I'll show you what that inequality is. But I need to describe the setup of the measurement. So this is the, the setup that Leggett and Garg pose. Say you have some dichotomic operator Q and you choose three possible measurement times, T1, T2, T3. At each pair of time, you measure the correlator. So you measure the correlator at one, two, two, three, one, three. Recall the correlator Cij would be like C1, two, two, three, whatever. It's the expectation value of, of the first operator and the second operator. Now, someone might jump in right now and say, well, whoa, 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 in quantum mechanics, we have the issue of operator ordering. Like this doesn't mean make sense to say 
you know, which one are you measuring before the other? Um, that's a valid question. And I'll touch on that in a second. But to somebody, for a second, somebody who believes the system behaves classically, this is uh, a fine definition of a uh, correlation between two measurements. So the conditions they derived, and I'll, I'll give an example in the next slide, but just to write the conditions first, is that you take these correlators, you sum them plus one, and you multiply by the correlators the measurement possible measurement outcome. So I'll, I'm going to write out every possible combination of the of the eight configurations in the next slide, um, and you'll see what I mean by this. But this is the the inequality that's known as the leggett gargan inequality, and what I'll call the LG three because I'm going to talk about many different conditions. Um, in general, though, and LG, to be clear, LGIs are my general term for leggett gargan inequalities. LG3s are my term for this specific set. So LGIs have been used uh, for testing quantum behavior in a growing number of fields. There's a review article, in hindsight, I should have cited here, um, that looks at it in transport uh, quantum biology, like looking at uh, different cell processes of converting uh, light to energy, which is sort of interesting. Um, obviously in quantum computing, nanomechanical systems, where they've used variations of the get guard tests as their way to, as their litmus test for their system behaving quantum mechanically. And really, so, I, I said this earlier, but the purpose is misunderstood. It's to identify this behavior. So and just for me to understand something a yeah. little bit better, uh, you're saying quantum mechanics, right? To, to test whether or not a system is quantum mechanical. But in the end, you're talking about whether or not the system uh, uh, satisfies the, this macro real, uh, realism condition, right? Non classicality in a way, rather than quantum mechanics. Yeah. Nature, so, right? That's true. So, really, it's um, what and how I'm more careful in the paper to say this that everything we're testing for is non classicality. We're working under the assumption that the alternative explanation is quantum mechanics. Um, but that's a very good point. And it's something that I'm a little bit less careful here, but in papers, you have to be, I think, clear of. Yeah. No, no, thank you. Thank you. Just to, to make point. things clear for me. Yeah. So I, let's take a system and a dichotomic observable, and let's measure it at three times. And let's think of every possible outcome we can have. We measure it at time one, we get plus. Actually, I'll do this one's more interesting. Measure at time one plus then minus, then plus, every combination. Let's consider all the correlators. So one and two are perfectly anti-correlated, so I'll put a minus one. Two and three are correlated, one and three are anti-correlated. I take the sum of these and I add one, and I find the lower bound of zero. There's no classical system you could come up with in this sort of simple toy model of measurements being plus or minus and comparing them at different times where you should get a negative correlation, sum of correlations here plus one. So there's this lower bound by zero. That's the uh, flavor of how these leggett gargan inequalities work. So, okay, is that okay? Good. So I have to add one amendment now because it's actually important. And I was debating including this or not, but I, wouldn't, I, would, I couldn't sleep at night if I didn't. That I mentioned earlier that the, um, for the, the marginal probabilities will only perfectly match with the conditions if there's a theorem known as Fine's theorem is satisfied. For the Bell inequalities, Fine's theorem is satisfied. For the LG3s, it was actually shown that it wasn't. And so we had to make an amendment to them. And this is an amendment that was made a couple years back and is still sort of spreading through the literature, is that you also need to measure the expectation value at each time. And you amend with the LG3s this condition called the LG2s. It's a similar looking condition but it also includes expectation values. And together the LG3s, so there's four of these, um, combined with the, wait, is there four? Yeah, the four LG3s, uh, four unique ones. Like you can have eight different measurement outcomes, but different combinations of the S1, S2 multiplying is the same. And there's 12 different conditions for LG2s for the different combinations of times. And so together, these are what's usually referred to as the leggett gargan inequalities. Um, and together they complete Fine's theorem. And for that, this set of measurements, the marginal probability matches the condition. So, so quick question about that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, uh, it was very intuitive how you presented the LG3s. And it was clear that anything that is, to me, it was clear that anything that violates those bounds, mm. is not gonna be possible to be explained classically. Yeah. Uh, why do you need the other 12 for the example you gave? I don't see it. So for that example, you don't. Ah, okay, okay, question. Yeah. 
but there could be times where the LG3s on their own miss quantum behavior. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. That was actually, that was, this is the topic of my master's thesis. I did an experiment to show that they miss quantum behavior sometimes. Okay. Um, no, so that definitely clarifies. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Thanks. Okay. And so together for this set of measurements, they, they form necessary sufficient conditions. Okay. So just to be clear what you need to know so far, um, identifying non-classical behavior is important. The Bell test did it. It had limitations in terms of the distance and even entanglement. Leggett and Garg overcame these. Leggett Garg tests have become very prevalent now as tests of quantum behavior. So what's the problem? So the question I, this, that begun this project was do systems exist which violate MR but satisfy the LGIs, even with this uh, caveat of them now satisfying Fine's theorem? Can they still miss things? So if you put a Venn diagram together, it's this middle area. Does this middle area exist? And if they do, the reason it's important is that Leggett guardian qualities can give false negative results of quantum behavior. And in a, in a experiment, in a scientific climate where we're trying to find quantum technology, this becomes important. So first of all, you could be like, great, you just said they're necessary in sufficient conditions. They satisfy Fine's theorem. You know what's going on? Well, proven is that they're necessary in sufficient conditions for a particular set of measurements. You measure three expectation values, three correlators. The question then is, what if I measure more elements of the system? What if I take measurements at more times? I measure different correlators. Can we find violations? So what do we need? We need other conditions for macroscopic realism. These conditions need to be for different data sets or they're not going to be able to find something new. And we need to then go find the physical systems. Can we, can we go back to the logic to try to understand what the claim is here? So the, the claim, as I understood it before, was uh, that uh, LGI uh, would be necessary and sufficient when you put together the two, the two conditions that, or the two sets of conditions that you talked about, necessary and sufficient for MR. But then you say now, no, no, they're not. It's because there's only this set of measurements. So can you qualify again what they're necessary and sufficient for exactly? So this was something that in general was overlooked, I think in the literature. They're necessary and sufficient conditions for macroscopic realism if you've taken the set of measurements that Leggett and Garg originally proposed. Meaning like there could be different sets of measurements for which this is not necessary or sufficient for, for macrorealism, is that it? That was the initial question. Does there exist other measurements I could take that right. make these no longer sufficient conditions on their own? Um, but then it would be funny to me because uh, uh, if then what's the value of the conditions, right? To me, this condition would be worth nothing if I can find a different set of measurements that, uh, that actually uh, shows that I'm violating MR without having the violations here. They will be not useful at all, no? Yeah, and so uh, a friend of mine uh, put it elegantly that our paper is taking a massive dump on the LGIs. That's not what we intended. It's just that we're essentially saying um, that it's true. These conditions are very limited, can be very limited in their use. I still would say, I mean, again, I may have misunderstood that huh, because, but if it is true, that these conditions are not necessarily sufficient for MR of a system. Therefore, I mean, okay, they may be sufficient to detect non-classical behavior, but that's it. They cannot distinguish between classical and non-classical then. That yeah. is huge. So, so you're jumping to the conclusion of the paper, but oh. yeah, it's, it is. Uh, that is true. It's the question we asked was like, is, are these fundamentally flawed? Um, okay. And well, it's not a fundamental flaw, right? I mean, it totally it's, is. If the previous claim was, if the previous claim was that this is why you used to distinguish classical from quantum, it would be. Okay, but it can be used to witness non-classical behavior, yeah. and that's already a something. Sufficient, right? A sufficient condition for non-classicality, sure, but not necessary. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. But but that's not nothing, right? That, that's a lot. Actually. No, no. But what I mean is that people, when they talked about what I know about uh, again popular popular knowledge that I have about LGI, is like, no, this is the way you test. Yeah. Okay. You know what I mean? Anyway. And it's interesting because Ray, I mean, Ray is actually friends with Anthony Leggett and he's spoken to him about this before. And Anthony Leggett himself said that this is just a misunderstanding in the literature, that his, his test wasn't meant to be the be all end all condition of it's a definitive test, but that's what it's become to be seen. And that's what people have been using it at. So he, Leggett would say that he proposes a sufficient condition, violating those inequalities are sufficient for being, for being non-classical, no, I guess. Yeah. So he, people took it as the necessary or sufficient condition. Yeah, and that's how it's been like sort of 
you know, if you go to a talk on this or if you read a paper where somebody claims their system is classical or quantum, they'll use it in that way. But yeah, it's that's not how I've seen it used. That's, not, that's all that I know about it. I've seen it used to claim that something is uh, non-classical. Yeah. Or classical, you know, exactly. Yeah, so this is, this is a limitation. It's actually interesting how this limitation comes up. I think that in and of itself is of interest. So I said we need more data sets. And so essentially, there's three ways we thought of that we could find um, expanded data sets. And fortunately, this field has been filled with people who have come up with other versions of conditions. Uh, it's similar to Bell test. Like people have come up with all different ways to test MR. And there isn't really a lot of like, like a zoo has been created of MR conditions that aren't all necessarily, they haven't really been compared or put next to each other compared to the LGIs. Um, so anyway, so I find three such conditions. One which, so the second one here, which uses higher order correlators. I'll explain what that is. One uses more measurement times um, and one that uses many level systems. So some of them overlap, but the sections are distinguished by their focus. And the focus of this section is the higher correlators. Section three is more times. Section uh, four is more levels. So the conditions exist. They're defined for more data sets. But you know, if, if I can only come up with like, um, weird toy examples that have no physical grounding, this work isn't very interesting. So the real problem at hand is to find physical system. And I just want to briefly visualize the cases. So a picture for a measurement of an expectation value. This is my measurement of a correlator. This is my measurement of a triple correlator. And this is how many levels the system has. So in the standard problem, we have a two level system. We're measuring the expectation values and these pairs of correlators. In section two, we add this extra caveat of measuring the triple correlator. In section three, uh, we're going to measure, oh, this is actually, sorry, this is incomplete. This should be green lines connecting all of them. That um, my one arrow overtook the other arrows. It should be, uh, every single one of these should be connected with a green line. And then in the last section, we're going to really focus on these extra measurement levels. <coughs> So first for higher order correlators, the, the new element we add here is measuring um, the state of the system, the correlation function of three states of time. So the way the conditions for this are formed is, okay, what is, let's ask the question of what's the probability of measuring operators Q1, 2 through N uh, and getting outcomes S1, S2 to SN. I'm gonna dub these the higher order LGIs. This isn't the name that Jonathan came up with. This is just a name I came up used in the paper for convenience. So, I mean, the proof, maybe it seems obvious, maybe it doesn't. The proof is in this paper of why uh, this, the probability of this measurement outcomes is equal to these, um, to this product of expectations. Maybe if you're familiar with like doing some operations with projectors, it might seem like sensible. But his, his condition is that each of the probabilities we measure um, is greater than or equal to zero. So really here, what is being done is uniquely fixing the underlying probability distribution for as many measurements as you want to take. So if you're willing to take five, you're willing to take six, whatever, he says, okay, if that's how many you're willing to take, let's measure every single possible um, combination of probability distributions, every marginal. So just to give a taste, so for the n equals three case, if you expand this out, you get a condition that depends on the correlator, uh, the expectation value at each time, the two time correlator at each pair of time and the three time correlator. And the pattern extends for n equals four, n equals five, et cetera. It just, you, you measure every correlator at those times. Now, there's a bit of an issue with operator ordering. Um, and that's, in quantum mechanics, the order of the operators being measured matters if they don't commute. And so we found a pattern in the form of correlators when you're taking projective uh, measurements. And that's that the correlator for two times is somewhat intuitive. It's, you know, say it's, if this is C12, it would be the expectation of Q12 um, plus Q21 averaged out. And it's, we find a similar pattern when we go to higher order correlators. Uh, the mathematical proof of that is in this appendix, if you're curious. But so these are the conditions that are the higher order LGIs, that each of these probabilities or written like this is greater than or equal to zero. So I was interested in finding three regimes, one in which the LGIs are satisfied and the third order LGIs are violated. 
I was curious if this violation becomes bigger if we move to fourth order LGIs. Um, and I was also interested in comparing all the lower order, all the three time conditions with the fourth time condition. There's two ways we do it. There's an analytical example using spin hack, which I won't go into. And then there was another approach we did um, where we used a specific spin hack model that had nice properties and just blasted it with a numerical search. And the specific model was a Hamiltonian where the spin half system is uh, rotating around the X axis. It's in some general initial state um, parameterized by this vector. And this could be a mixed state if this uh, V isn't a unit vector. And then the operator we measure is the sigma Z operator. And I chose these because they give very simple looking correlators. It's just cos functions as scaled and sine functions, sums and products of them. So anyways, did a numerical search over the different initial states and times. And what I found is uh, you can see here, there's a regime in which the LG2s and LG3s are both satisfied, but the third order LGI has a very large violation. Uh, there's a, a point here which could be expanded to be more than a point with some decoherence uh, in which, again, the LGIs are satisfied, but the fourth order LGIs are violated and violated to a much greater extent. And then here, if I compare all the three time conditions with the fourth time condition, again, you find you can find violations when you add the fourth measurement time. My conclusion from this section uh, would be, or, or how I'd summarize it, is that as you increase the number of correlators you measure for more and more times, you can detect violations of MR that you can miss when you take lower, uh, less time measurements. So you can find violations by adding more measurement times and measuring the correlators. So I repeated this with a spin half system that's in the supplementary materials. Uh, and for those maybe a bit more familiar with this type of work, uh, all my results do satisfy the looters bound, which is the maximum quantum bound. And that's, I proved that in appendix B. Okay, so what if you don't measure more correlators, but you just add more times? So I keep tacking on more times and I measure the two time correlators, but I don't measure these three time or four time correlations. Can I get something there? So that was my second question. So conditions for this have been derived and this is what they look like. And it's for any amount of measurement times. So the measurement time is N and it either has to be greater than one or greater than zero, depending on the times. The N equals four case I show is, is just a, a sum of LG3, so it's not of interest. It's, it's the same conditions added up, so you, you couldn't find anything new if you wanted. But with N equals five, it's unique. And someone had actually explored these a few years ago, and they called them Pentagon inequalities. Um, I present an argument in the paper, and I actually contacted the authors about this to be sure, because it was sort of a bold claim. And that's they applied decoherence inconsistently. So when they were doing the experiment, some runs of the experiment, they assumed there was decoherence. And in other runs, they assumed it didn't. And they mix and match correlators from the both. Um, if you can do that, you can make any set of conditions greater than or less than zero. So it's, it's not exactly a fair argument. Uh, and the reason they did that was because they couldn't find a regime in which the LG3s were satisfied and the PIs violated. So we find two interesting PI violations, uh, one via numerical search over many level systems, uh, which the LG3s are satisfied and the PIs are violated. I'll, I'll give a quick summary about this slide because I think I've said a lot um, without stopping. And an analytical example for a five level system. So in the last section, I said, okay, if you measure more correlators, you can find new quantum behavior. Now I'm saying if you add more measurement times and still stick with two time correlators, you can find new quantum behavior. I did this via numerical search. Uh, how, how am I doing for time? Just to know if I should skip parts or not. No, you're fine. I need to leave at too sharp. That if you oh. finish any time before that, in the discussion, that should be fine. I also want to have some time for logistics too, but you're okay. fine. I mean, it's one now, so. Okay, cool. I don't know why I thought I had to stick to 30 minutes. That was my mistake. Probably I, somebody told you, but uh, it's fine if you stick to that. And then, you know, even if you don't, having a bound is good, even if, you don't, if you're not constrained by it. Cool. You asked me, but, but, but I told you that you have more time than 30 minutes, so I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it is the last talk is 30, so I'm confused. Okay, so um, one thing that, I mean, I don't know if this is interesting or not. Maybe it is to some of you. Um, if we want to do diatomic operators measured at higher level systems, there isn't a certain uh, a formulation of that currently in the LGI literature, but it's actually not hard to do. So you take your operator and you write it in this form. So 
A is the state that's different from the other states in your dichotomic measurement. So for example, if this was, um, this could be one, okay, this, this would be a diagonal matrix with one and minus one or minus one and one if this was a two level system. If there's a three level system, it'd be one, minus one, minus one, you get the picture. You can look at the evolution of all of Q by just looking at the time evolution of these A's and you rewrite the time evolved Q as these time evolved vectors. And these are like the vectors of interest, the ones that are unique from the others. Now, not every possible Q is gonna be experimentally feasible um, because you, know, you can't have, I mean, not every possible combination of times and Hamiltonians can give you every possible combination of vectors. Certain Hamiltonians and times can only give you a limited set of these vectors. They can't take any value. So I limit them by their eigenstates and I formulate the correlators in terms of the initial state and these different time evolved states at different points. Um, and this is, these are one of the topics that I'm happy to go into more, but I also, I'm just trying to present it uh, briefly. So, so quick, quick question though. Uh, what happens if you don't have purely dichotomic operators like that, uh, but instead you have that uh, once that is not distinguishable from all the others, but almost, you know, if there's some degree of approximation, can uh, you get bounds, worse bounds perhaps doing that or uh, something like that? But bounds nevertheless, right? So uh, I, th I had an answer up until you added the second part. The, the first part of can you do beyond uh, dichotomic, yes. There are other operators you can create, like trichotomic, whatever, like there's four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, but that still requires you to be able to distinguish perfect. Exactly. I mean, exactly. what if you are not fully able to distinguish the perfect? Why that's a really good question. I, I never thought of that. That's, okay. um, that's actually that, if I had thought of that four months ago, that would have been another section. The that, I think it's an interesting question to ask, a very useful one too, because in practice, we have that a lot. <laughs> yeah. Actually, that's very, actually, it's related to uh, one of the future questions I became interested in that I'll, I'll pose at the end, but I hadn't thought of that. Um, but you can create higher level operators as combinations of dichotomic operators. So anyway, so I run the numerical search. I tried a spin half system. I went to incredibly small, um, like 10 to the negative nine. Um, okay, anyways, uh, uh, that, that actually doesn't mean anything to you. But I did extensive numerical searches over spin half systems. And I conclude that it's likely that the um, spin half system, you can't get such a violation, which is consistent with the original paper not being able to do this either. Now, could I run the parameter search for smaller intervals? Yes. And could it have possibly existed? Yes. So I can't definitively rule that out. But I think I'm fairly, fairly confident it doesn't exist. And I list my numerical searches in an appendix for people to convince themselves. But for a three level system or higher, it does exist. So you get this violation of the Pentagon inequality without a violation in the LG3s. Um, there's also another model, an analytical model, because for n of greater than four, um, it becomes hard to simulate. So what you notice if you look at the structure of the LG3s and the PIs is what the PIs are measuring is uh, a smaller degrees of interference terms because they measure all the correlators together. So they get, you can think of them in a sense as giving you a finer picture of the system's interference terms. If these interference terms are sufficiently small and uh, within a, a, a certain regime, if you plug them all into the PIs and LG3s, you find all the LG3s are satisfied and the PIs are violated. And all the LG2s will also be satisfied if all the QIs are greater than this bound. So this just became a math problem of can I find such a regime? Uh, and one easy way to set this up is to try to have the uh, inner product of all the states to be equal. It just simplifies the problem. So you take five orthogonal basis vectors, you define some u to be the uh, overlap of all of these, the, the, the average of all of these. And I define a new set of orthogonal vectors, my vi, as each of these, ortho sorry, non-orthogonal vectors, as the original orthogonal vectors rotated in towards one another. And that's what these VI essentially are. They're the orthogonal vectors slightly rotated towards one another. And then it gives, in this case, I mean, it's intuitive that the overlap between all of them will be equal. I call that alpha. And I choose my initial state to be at the center of all those vectors, just because it creates a symmetric and sort of simple picture. Well, in that case, I mean, this is just algebra, but you plug those in and these are the, the values for the correlators and the expectation values become a function of that overlap. 
alpha. And I can choose alpha to be 3 eighths. So all QI are zero and the CI are in the desired bound. Um, I already gave a physical example for this section. So we didn't need to provide a physical example here. But um, one way to construct this physically is you consider the unitary that cycles these eigenstates to one another. And so this will cycle your different VI to one another. It's sort of like a, a rotation around that central U in five dimensions, if you will. You write it as an evolution and you can use the eigenstates of its unitary to construct the Hamiltonian. I mean, this isn't such a big deal. This is just saying, you know, we came up with this set of eigenstates um, that creates this violation. Hey, there is a Hamiltonian that can do it if you want to do it like that. So that's two of the, the cases. So you have higher order correlators and more measurement times. The last thing I was curious about was what if all I have is a, a the only thing I add is a trichotomic observable. So I have an operator for states A, B, and C, and it distinguishes them perfectly. And um, it's going to give, it, it's set up such that each of these operators distinguishes one and gives a positive eigenvalue for that and a negative eigenvalue for the other two. So the sum of them is the negative of the identity. Thus, we only really need two of them. So we can consider the data set of the nine averages for Q, R, and S the nine correlators. Um, and the conditions for macroscopic realism were derived to be these. And this is really just looks like the LG2s and LG3s, but now you have these trichotomic um, operators built from different dichotomic ones. Run a numerical search again, and we find a similar thing, that there's you know, this pocket in here, this regime in here, in which the LG2s and LG3s are satisfied, but this three-level LG3 um, is violated. So uh, we'll have a lot of time for discussion then. So uh, uh, just to recap, we identified limitations in the LGIs as tests for non-classical behavior. Uh, the LGIs can be satisfied in MR, can still be violated in these three cases of higher order correlators, more measurement times, and many valued variables for measurements. There's some future work. Uh, I separate them as those that I think are maybe a bit more superficial and those that are a bit more, um, will take more thought. So at first, I mean, it's of some interest to experimentally implement these. Uh, I mean, maybe not some, I guess how attached you are to experiments will tell you whether or not you think that's very important or less important, but we have the Hamiltonian, so you should really go to the lab and do it. And we gave the system of how to do it. Work will need to be done to refine different protocols that exist to make them more robust. So we, we're not proposing a perfectly robust test, but we're identifying uh, cases or ways that you can make your test more robust to detecting M violations of MR. This is somewhat interesting in saying, like, can we identify the relationships between the zoo of conditions, which can be violated independently of others, which are stricter to some detect certain quantum effects than others. And then I think there's two sort of more broader questions of interest. And so as a overarching story, we said that with more measurement times and higher level systems, you can tease out finer uh, interference terms. And that's really what these things are. When we're looking at um, our system and we're taking more measurement, we're able, actually there's a very nice review written by this on Hallowell that I can reference if anyone wants to go further with that, but that we're able to identify more minute quantum interference terms. And with some conditions, the interference term is too small to detect. So we can tease out these finer terms with more measurement times and higher level systems. However, both of these things are experimentally harder to do and they add more noise. You want a higher level system, it's more noisy. You want to take more measurement times, it's more noise. So I'm saying with more of these, you get um, greater violations of, more able to detect violations, but in the same way, because of the physical experiment, it hinders your ability to detect these violations. So does there exist a noise threshold in MR in which regardless of how many measurements you take, no matter what you do, if a certain level of noise is present, you can never detect a violation of MR, is a question I have. Um, that I think is like fairly, it, it, it's reasonable to assume it could exist, but what is it, um, I think is interesting. And then conversely, what if you had infinite measurement precision and zero noise? Can you always come up with a test? And, and so this is a bit more abstract, I guess, and a little bit less grounded. Like, um, does the, if the system behaves quantum mechanically, if our world behaves quantum mechanically, then 
is it always possible to detect some type of quantum behavior somehow in a system? Classical, like would classical systems not exist, not exist? If we always had infinite measurement precision and zero noise, we could come up with some test to show that it's actually fundamentally, the world is quantum mechanical. Does that exist? So those are two broad questions I'm sort of interested in now um, based on this sort of work. And that was it. All right, thank you very much. Yeah. Cool. Are there any questions? I do have questions. Uh, I have one small yeah. one. Uh, sure. Go for it. Oh, okay, so your last slide, right? You talk about those noise thing, right? Do you happen to know like what kind of experiments you are thinking about? Because for example, right, if you are thinking of intraframetric kind of stuff, right, then then this 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 threshold noise threshold one of them comes from the Heisenberg limit, right? Uh, that's interesting. So I was wondering whether 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 it is well known what kind of noise comes with setups that measures MR because certain certain setups actually comes with a fundamental limit of their measurements already. That's a good point. So in experiments uh, in terms of um, found, I'll call them foundational tests in LGIs, mm -hmm. have predominantly been with superconducting systems and like okay. and with NMR. NMR because it's easy, superconducting because the observables, uh, it's an easier to make an argument that they're macroscopic observables. I see, I see. So those are the two, and outside of that, it's people uh, using the tests to like verify whatever system it is. And so they're not so interested in like, um, yeah, foundational tests of, you know, how many levels can we go to, how many measurement times. Yeah, I was just wondering because the Heisenberg limit I, I, I mentioned earlier, right, uh, might be something uh, might be a good starting point to check this kind of threshold if you can massage these whole inequalities and stuff into a setup that is interferometric in nature, which might be possible since since the only difference is that now you replace all your processes with beam splitters and stuff, right? Which is basically Hadamard gates and a bunch of stuff. Yeah, actually, a paper came out just this year on uh, a construction of LGI tests with the double slit experiment. Yeah. Uh, so. It's, so that might be a place to look at, I guess. Yeah, that's that's interesting. I didn't know that exists. <laughs> yeah, is it, it will, what I was originally thinking, and that's a good point, I hadn't thought of it, uh, that limit, was that you just create some, uh, try different noise models. Like you take some T1 model, some T2 model, combine them in different ways, and just see like at what point um, does that, like in what way does the noise scale um, with the system and like, you know, if, if the noise scales really, really poorly, then like right away, you're going to get no, like if there's enough decoherence, you can't measure an LGI violation, even with the basic simple LGIs. Um, yeah, yeah. But like in what, and how does the noise have to scale with the levels of the system? Yeah, I guess I was thinking directly more from the noise that I kind of like heard before. Like, for example, if you, if your experiments uses photons, right, then automatically one over F and photon shot noises are all going to be part of your bounds, right? Yeah. Okay, that's all I have. Thanks. Yeah, it's a very nice talk. Thank you. People? Hey, very nice talk. Thank you very much. I didn't know about this stuff. Okay. I wanted to ask about uh, if you knew about uh, how this thing connects with a couple of things. Uh, first, uh, this thing of macro realism sounds a little bit like uh, the way people talk about contextuality, right? But uh, instead of like talking about pre-existing properties of a uh, quantum system, right? You're asking whether it's like a time version of that, right? Like a time extended version of that. It's like if you have a different times, you're asking if you, your properties are compatible somehow. At a, um, yeah, so set, right? it's interesting. Yeah. So there was, um, I think for a while, there was a view in LGIs that um, the the reason you can even get a violation is because the operators that you're measuring don't commute with one another. But there was a recent paper, actually, this was just like four months ago, uh, in which people set up experiments where they did LGI violations um, with commuting observable. So, but, I mean, that's as far, I don't really uh, know too much about the connection between LGI tests or MR and contextuality. It's a good question though. It's something, these questions always inspire me to, to read more. Hmm. Thank you. So there's like, um, well, this kind of analysis 
of uh, contextuality in terms of uh, well the inequalities and stuff. There's kind of like this and bad inequalities, right? And there's the stuff that they has to do with the cohen specker theorem and stuff like that. Is there, there's more like, um, the others are, are more about non-classicality, this thing of the inequalities in general. And the cohen specker is a property of quantum mechanics itself, right? So I was wondering, if, is there a parallel analysis of this thing saying something like in, in quantum mechanics, you cannot have macro realism. realism. Okay. Yeah, so, um... So, I mean, if, if you don't have macro realism, it's definitely not classical. Um, and usually the way it's proposed is just that the alternative assumption is um, some interpretation of quantum mechanics. But um, I mean, that's sort of an assumption you, we've, most papers put in by hand. Um, so, I mean, yeah, I don't know if there is um, an argument to say that this has to be quantum mechanical theory. I, I'm not sure that's what you're asking is that like, does it oh, well, no, I mean, is there, is there a theorem that says that the quantum mechanics is not overall, like in the same sense, like of these theorems of that have, have to do with what people relate to contextuality? Okay. Uh, so More like, because I mean, uh, I like those theorems because they kind of like uh, talk about, they give a defini mathematical definition of what they mean, right? With the. Uh, yeah, right. Uh, yeah, so there's, um, so there's a different set of, actually, uh, work that I could sort of point you to is there's a different set of uh, bounds and they're called looter bounds and the okay. looter bounds are the quantum mechanical limit and so uh, a system and it's based on the same principle of violating MR but quantum systems can only violate MR to a certain degree uh, and they can't violate it beyond a certain bound and that's true for any condition you create um, so that work is yeah it's the work on on looter bounds so I, okay. I understand it's sort of at a cool. A simple level because I had to prove the, our conditions stay within the looter's bounds. Um, but yeah. Okay. There's so the option. second thing I wanted the, you to tell me if you can relate uh, is the the consistent histories approach. So because I'm aware that the Halliwell has worked in these things, I think. If it's the same Halliwell, I don't know. So the which approach? The Halliwell? The con consistent histories. Oh, yeah. Um, so, because can you relate the coherence with this? So, there's people that work in trying to talk about what the macroscopic limit is of the of quantum systems based on evolution and uh, the coherence and stuff like that. So, I was wondering if there's a connection between these things and that. So, is there a connection between like the consistent histories and um, the like Eckhart inequalities? Yeah. 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 So, actually, the um, formulation for the third order correlators was um, sort of inspired by the idea of consistent history. So with, with the Leggett guard inequalities, when you're measuring uh, the different correlators, you can sort of interpret that as looking at the path the state goes through. So if I go back, I mean, if you yeah, yeah. yeah, that's, uh, that's, what, uh, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, that may, yeah okay. I thought they may be related. Yeah, it's, um, no, that's a good point. One more slide back. Oh, man. My computer's so slow, sorry. One more slide. Maybe it wasn't so necessary. Yeah, okay. So here, so if we have the correlators, we can, yeah. like, for example, if our correlators are 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, there's two different histories we can trace out, but we can't distinguish um, between them. You can take this idea further and say, okay, what else do we have to measure to be able to distinguish between these different histories? You don't get a perfect answer. You don't distinguish. Uh, Actually, you do distinguish these ones with a three time correlator. So you would get uh, one times one times one. The triple order correlator would be one. The triple order correlator here would be minus one. So hmm. the, the higher order correlator is a way to distinguish, to remove the ambiguity of the different, um, in, of the different consistent histories from the Leggett guard picture. Oh, okay. Okay, cool. So there's like, uh, can, can you summarize again what the relation is? Yeah, so with the uh, Leggett guard inequalities, yeah. what you're doing is you're ass assigning correlators that trace out sort of the path the system evolved in. Yeah. And you're putting bounds on the possible paths. With the yeah. higher order correlators, you are further distinguishing between those paths. So here, the, this evolution of the system from plus, 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 and this evolution of minus, 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 
has uh, the same sort of history from the view of the Leggett garden equality. But you can okay. add more measurements to distinguish between these paths. Okay, okay, okay. So, yeah, well, so can one then relate uh, this macro realism with the consistency condition that has to do with the coherence? So consistency condition is that if you have a bunch of uh, projectors, right? The, basically the correlators between those projectors at different times. Uh, how to put it? Well, I mean, I, I don't know exactly how to say it with words, but the idea is that you have a decoherence function of that's telling you uh, whether the measurements in at different times are that are associated with uh, like a set of properties that's a history, right? Um, they're, if they're if they have coherence between them. So if basically if they, you can write the, the density matrix as some kind of diagonal over the set of histories. So is there a connection between that and these inequalities? So not that I know of, um, and that might actually, that's, that sounds like a very interesting project actually. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, so yeah, I think this is very interesting because it puts this kind of stuff of, uh, um, I think if there's a, 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 connect, a connection, I was actually thinking of if there would be some kind of connection between this histories approach stuff and all the contextuality stuff. Right. Yeah. Because I mean, the, we're talking about uh, whether we have uh, this macroscopic limit in terms of uh, what we understand that is quantum. There's like, right, is the incompatibility of different properties of a system like on a given state. Right. right. So I think this is, a, this is a very nice bridge between those two things. Yeah. Also, a last thing maybe is. Has there been any work in trying to work something like this with continuous variables? Yeah, so that's actually also um, fairly recent. Um, I mean, one way that people uh, have done recent is they sort of just draw a line in the sand. So they'll say, they'll take a continuous system and they'll say, okay, well, we'll just make this the distinguishing point to make it dichotomic. Um, but the first paper I saw on truly sort of continuous variable conditions maybe like four months ago, five months ago, it was actually Hallowell who wrote it. Um, he proposes new conditions using continuous variables. So, because I, I guess if the figure of merit of all this stuff is the, the correlators, and then Gaussian states will have something, some special properties, right? Respect to systems of spins. Because then all the correlator time correlators are related to each other like uh, by big theorem. Yeah, I mean, so I honestly so I, about that, but that's... Yeah, okay, no, I'm, but I'm just saying that they, it makes sense that one could derive a condition uh, like oh, uh, an equal, for Gaussian states and inequality that encompasses all correlators because all correlators are dependent on the two point correlator, right? Yeah. Okay, that was it. Thank you very much. Very nice talk, really. I really enjoyed it. Right. Uh, some of my questions were actually people's questions, so uh, maybe I'm gonna I'm gonna go in a different direction. The, um, well, maybe uh, one more on the continuous variable thing. Um, the way in which you build these inequalities, though, is clearly incompatible with doing it for uh, unbounded operators, right? Because uh, the correlators for unbounded operators can be unbounded, <laughs> and the inequalities you build in are multiplied by the possible expectation of the operators. Uh, so if you have an unbounded one, one of the cases would be a sum on infinite terms, right? So you have a, either the bound becomes trivial, meaning like less than infinity, or the left-hand side is still defined on that. So it must be different, right? I, do you have any idea about exactly how they do the continuous variables one? I, I, no, I haven't actually read that paper, but this gives me a good excuse to, you know, you always like add up papers you're meaning to read and you never get to it, but. Okay. And it's Hallowell's paper, so I can always ask him questions about Just it. Just the way in which you build them, the way you showed you build them, would not work for continuous yeah. variables. It has to be different. Because when you have unbounded operators, the correlators can be unbounded as well. The outcome, the, the product of the outcome of all the measurements could be unbounded. So the way that you're building them is, uh, doesn't seem to be compatible directly. It must be different. I mean, with Gaussian states, I can see how you can do it. Uh, in general, I have no idea. I um, mean, I don't know. yeah. 
Dan, about, about this um, about this Gaussian stuff and the, the continuous variables, um, it isn't what we're trying to do here just uh, detecting negativity in the Wigner function? Yeah, that's what I was about to ask next, is uh, the, the negativity in the Wigner function, it's certainly uh, uh, the weakness of non-classicality because that is the joint probability distribution that doesn't exist. But it is not written as an inequality. That's my point. So what I'm looking for is a translation from the negativity of the Wigner function into an inequality. And what I see right away is that an inequality in the way he's doing it wouldn't work. Because you get right. a well, um, I mean, ultimately, I think how this would be done in an experiment is you have your continuous variable system and you measure a whole bunch of marginals about it. Uh, and then you uh, do try and do some sort of state tomography from this. And you see if the state that you get out of your tomography process has negativity in it. So but that is not a, an inequality form of it. So yeah, that's well, certainly why, right. Maybe this is a good question then. Why are we attached to inequalities? I don't know. Why, why don't we just have a general tomography procedure and we say the state's quantum when that shows that it has negativity? Mm -hmm. um, like why, why are we attached to inequalities? No, I mean, the at its root, the inequalities are just like a representation. Um, they're like taking the science and turning it into a, a test. So, no, I mean, you can, you don't lose anything, I don't think, by, by leaving them, just besides the convenience of them. So it would have been yeah. enough to prove then that you can have a state tomography and show that you would cannot build a joint probability distribution with, to prove that LGI were not enough, right? Sure. So, I mean, like you're saying to take a state tomography, which I agree, but you're saying like to get like all the information of the system. No, no, what I mean is like, you can get with state tomography, with enough state tomography, you can find if there is or not a joint probability distribution that would explain the outcome of your measurements, uh, of the, all the measurements that you've done in your state tomography, uh, because you can actually reconstruct the probability distribution that we would come from. Yeah, yeah. And then the moment you find that one of those, that you have one state for which LGI is satisfied, but then you cannot reconstruct the probability distribution. You've already proven that as wrong. Right. That LGI is not enough, at least, right? Yeah. So I guess the question from Dan makes sense. Uh, why do we really want to get inequalities? And what is the advantage you get from the inequalities that you wouldn't get in state tomography? Well, I understand the purpose in experiments in, in setting a clear line in the sand with one specific goal and seeing, do we cross it or not? I think it's narratively very uh, useful, but but fundamentally, I don't see why inequalities play any special role. It, I think I think it becomes less useful the more continuous you become, right? That's the point. So the moment that you have a continuous variable, I don't see how you can easily translate into inequalities that draw a line on the sun, right? Maybe you can in the case of Gaussian states. Uh, maybe you can. Maybe you can set up correlations between the two point correlators, relations between the two point correlators and some other things. Because again, the whole probability distribution is given by the two point functions, right? So you can certainly characterize the negativity, but you don't have it. If it's Gaussian states, all right. So then the, the answer to people's question is right there. Gaussian states will never violate LGI kind of inequalities because those things are classical. You have a, a positive probability, this joint probability distribution. Right. There's there's always a classical explanation That's right. you mentioned to do with the Gaussian. That's um, right. They, yeah. you, could, you could do same question though. You just replace that with a squeeze state. Squeeze is Gaussian. Squeeze states are Gaussian states. Yeah, it's, a, it's a classical theory. What's behind? Yeah. Yeah. Well, but you can try to talk about what happens with when you use projectors in a continuous uh, system, right? In finite particle you states. Gaussian. You broke Gaussian. Yeah, no, you have a Gaussian state, but you don't have Gaussian operations. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. If you have a Gaussian state and non-Gaussian operations, you can certainly ask this question. I mean, the, 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 the correlators, they're, they're going to still be related to, to the two-point function, uh, the correlators of the, the system, but the, your measurements are done through this projector, right? It's not gonna... Yeah, but you can actually quantify the negativity of the bigger function after the projection, and that definitely gives you... I mean, it's not an experimental... Yeah, no, no, I mean, over the, over the start of the negativity, yeah, I, I agree, you have a point. In principle, yeah, you should be able to, to detect the negativity of the Wigner function if you... you the point is translated to experiments, and that's the point that is, I think, super interesting here, if you can do it. Because, again, uh, you, can, you can get a lot of, of... You can definitely talk in theory about it, the Wigner function will be negative, but then if your ability to measure it is not good enough to see that negativity, then is when, you know, translate to simple measurements. What are the crucial ones you actually need to do to prove it? That is nice. If you can. 
Actually, uh, send me a recording of this all because I'm I'm like furiously writing down questions, but it is recording. Okay. If you're okay with it, I'll actually post it publicly for sure. everyone. Um, another question I have, Sayan, uh, uh, how about the, the quantum to classical transition? As in, like, we know that macroscopic systems are macroscopically realist <laughs> out of experience, or at least they look like it. Yeah. Uh, is there any way to explain with this kind of formalism how it happens when you increase the size of the system or something? Now, what is exactly the way in which suddenly you go to a limit in which you don't violate anymore those inequalities, you know? Maybe trying to understand the quantum classical transition in terms of this? Yeah, so actually, it, it sort of relates that the final uh, question I had, because if you sort of just, if all you knew about quantum mechanics is this work, you would come to the conclusion that a macroscopic system, it should be very easy to detect violations of uh, MR. Because I'm saying you go to many levels, the more levels you go to, the more easy it is to detect MR or the more possibilities there is to detect MR. So you should then go and say, well, macroscopic system, I mean, I could come up with any kind of measurement to get a violation. But the reason, I mean, okay, the, 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 the decoherence argument is that you don't because there's some level of noise in the system and the amount of noise increases as you increase the number of levels. Um, so I think, it, I think what you're saying is it's that question of what's the, what amount of noise um, can be present and you can still get a violation. Because yeah. if you go to these like inequalities, I have like graph, um, I mean, you, you, you can probably remember them. They're just like, sinusoidal functions. And if you turn up the decoherence, so you add some type of, uh, let's say like a T1 relaxation time, uh, and like you apply that to the state of your density matrix as it's evolving, you just see that these like LGIs, they're oscillating and then they slowly just dampen, 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 and they eventually flatline, um, which sort of makes sense. With enough decoherence, you have no information of the system and the correlation between any two states is just zero. So um, I think the answer is in the, uh, application of and the existence of decoherence yeah sure i mean it's certainly the coherence what we expect to do it for us but i was hoping more um, a better characterization of how the and how fast and, and in what way the coherence takes us out of you know having this you can quantify and i was thinking here you can actually tell how fast you're gonna go to the classical or the quantum to classical limit you know so if, if you know your rate of decoherence then yeah you do like if you you, you could redo all these numerical searches and add a decoherence term. And actually, in my, I did that in my last project, the one I did for my master's thesis, had that element of that. Like if we're applying decoherence, we were comparing how fast do certain systems um, decay to classical behavior and which condition can keep detecting it first. Right. So that was how we found that the LG2s could detect violations, the LG3s couldn't. We took a spin half system and we just did um, amplitude dampening and we compared the maximum LG2 and the LG3 violation. And after some time, the LG3 violation became positive. So no violation, but the LG2 stayed negative. So, so this, is, this, is, uh, this is super interesting too. Maybe one more comment because you quickly say squeezed and that's something that um, it's kind of a spoiler for Jose Polo though. But the, the uh, squeeze states that you mentioned right as uh, when we were talking Gaussian states are classical. And Gaussian quantum mechanics is a classical theory, actually, about squeeze states. Squeeze states can have entanglement. You can multi mode squeeze states, still, they're classical. You will not be able to violate very inequalities with Gaussian quantum mechanics. You need to violate Gaussianity somewhere. With people, for example, said in the measurements, in the measurements, you violate Gaussianity and then you can acknowledge that entanglement. But the, when, you, when you do this parametric down conversion and you create a two mode squeeze state, the state in itself, is not a state that you cannot describe with, uh, with a classical theory. I can, I totally can. Gaussian quantum mechanics is a classical theory, even with entanglement in it. Right. Of course, I would not be able to violate any inequality without violating Gauss uh, Gaussianity. That's the point. Yeah. In some point, as in like in the measurement, for example. Yeah, I mean, that's how they do it with uh, the continuous variable quantum computing people, right? It's yep. the measurement that they make. That's right, the measurement is non-Gaussian, yes. Yeah, yes. Right. All right, cool. Any more questions? This was really good. I think people, people is unmuting himself. So I... Have you with NMR on this? Sorry, I, maybe I missed it. Yeah, no, it's, I, uh, so the first experiment I did on this was with an NMR system, yeah. And did you check that it's non-classical? Yeah, so, um, so yes, but if you are, anyone who's a skeptic of NMR, I would direct them first to, um, Oh man, there's a paper Ray wrote where he just had a single qubit 
And um, he has it connected through a unitary operation with a bunch of other uh, SD, DPSC. If Ray watches this video, he's gonna be hate me for not remembering this. <laughs> but um, you don't actually need entanglement to get uh, quantum behavior. I mean, you know that, but you actually need even less than that. And with, uh, with a single sort of pure state and the unitary operations, you can do computations that aren't possible classically. Okay. So I think that's a stronger argument for NMR being quantum than LGIs. Um, but, uh, but yeah, we did get non-classical non behavior with the NMR system. Okay, cool. All right. This was a really good talk. Thank you, Sajan. I mean, let's thank you again and stop the recording. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you guys for having me.